bit more of a crowd? Or Why not? OK. They now don't know what they're missing. They will know what they're missing. OK. Good afternoon. I'm Arjen. I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about a bit of STEM, a bit of school. And I'll first, first tell you a little bit of history on, um, on how I got here, because this is, new, this is a relatively new thing for me, and I suppose also for you. And um, so in 2013, I was at the Perth LinuxConf, and I did an interview with James Bromberger about 3D printers in schools. And that's still slowly progressing, but it hasn't moved as fast as I, as I hoped it would. Uh, what I wanted to do is actually build 3D printers in, in schools, with schools, with classrooms. And um, there's a whole range of, of interesting issues with that. Um, of course, technically it can be done, but um, you know, that's, still, that's still work in progress. Meanwhile, I was asked early last year by a primary school teacher um, around year five with a bit of year four and some year sixes to look at a robotics program and they had an offer for, for a group to come in and, and show some robots and play with the kids for a couple of hours and then those robots would walk out the door again. And I thought that was a bit unfortunate. So she asked me, and so did she, and she, she, she asked me, well, you know, are there any alternatives? And I said, well, I'll get back to you and had a look around. And I found this, um, this cute little critter called a mirror bot. Um, I don't know, I'll hold it up and you can capture it later. Um, it's laser cut MDF um, from an open design. It has an open hardware circuit board. It runs on a little Arduino Pro Mini and the firmware is open. And it has a little, um, the version two, which I'm holding in my hand, has a, um, has one of those little Wi-Fi modules and the firmware for that is also open. The little Wi-Fi module acts as a web server and the code for that, of course, is also open. So the entire thing is open from start to finish. Ben Pert in the UK um, developed this and he's awesome. He's so, so responsive and kind and the engineering of this version two is so beautiful. It doesn't have any pegs to hold it together. It just slots together. It's very neat. It comes as a flat pack in about five or six layers. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. And um, I'll tell you what, what the kids have been doing with that. So after a while, I got back to the kids, uh, to the teacher, and we, uh, we organized some stuff in the classroom. Um, so we had to set up you know, a bit of a plan on what to do with this, how to actually organize things. So that is the rough idea. So many kids, which is why I mentioned it, many kids love tactile stuff. They need to touch things, interact with them, and so on. They don't actually get much opportunity to do this, particularly in the higher, um, the higher years in, in primary school. Um, you know, there's less play and more, more sitting at the desk and, and drudging through, through, um, through paper and, um, and text, and that is quite unfortunate. The reason for that are quite diverse, but in a nutshell, you know, teachers are very, very busy. The material is not always very interesting, and it's not their fault, you know? Who has time to, to, to do all that research and develop and, and create lots of cool things? And the more, the more hands-on you make it, the more preparation times it requires. So we're thinking, well, let's, let's, do, let's see if we can actually improve on that. Um, so I'll, I'll send, this is a sideline, but I'll send around some, um, some fossil skulls that we've printed. And, um, but it's an example of how you can make things tactile. So if you just grab one of those and you just send it backwards, I expect all the family members to rock up back later. There were five and there will be five. <laughs> if you really want one, talk to me because I can just print a new one. It's all good. Um, so as an example, that makes history tangible. You can touch it. It's not the same as an image on the screen. Um, and it's not the same as a, as a diagram on paper. It, even a 3D projection on screen of one of those skulls, and I do have those skulls on my screen, I can show you the difference, you can tell me for yourself, it is not the same. There's actually a significant difference between the virtual and the real world that you can touch. And for many of these, these, these are prints of scans of fossils that are millions of years old. And 
you can see and feel the teeth. And there's just something special about that. Okay, so that's the kind of things we're trying to aim for with the actual tangible idea. Um, and then we wanted to do a real project, not just an experience. So we didn't want to come into the classroom, do some stuff, and then throw out, out again. And I was aiming to actually leave the robots there rather than, you know, they would belong to the classroom at that point rather than actually walking out of the school again. So the, the school would be able to keep using them. Now, whether a school does actually, or an individual classroom, does actually keep using them, you know, that's an entirely different matter that I don't have direct control over, but at least they would have the opportunity. Um, so they needed to be relatively cheap. Now, these cost a hundred and, hundred and something dollars. And to give you a, a reference point, we can buy five of these for the price of one Lego kit. Are they, are they better or worse? They're primarily different, and they o offer a number of opportunities that with LEGO you wouldn't have. So that, that's quite interesting. Another thing I, felt very, I still feel very strong about, strongly about is we like to do entire classes, not, not an extension course for some of the kids in the class who have bothered to sign up, who have a really high grade in, in science or maths or something like that. The entire, the entire class, in my opinion, would be quite capable of doing these things, and it actually raises the level of the entire class, and it also gives an opportunity for the kids that might not nat naturally pick something, for whatever reason, they need a bit of exposure, and they need to decide whether this is something they might be interested in. If they don't do it, they won't figure it out. So it's really important that it's inclusive and not, not and not inclusive in a complicated way. You know, you can have a subset and then have an outreach program to drag everybody else in, or you can just do it with the entire class. So we want to do it in school, in school time, and uh, preferably fit it into the curriculum. So that's the, um, that's the idea. So uh, that gives you a basic idea. So what happened next? Um, local news, all cool. Um, so we created classroom kits, the little brown boxes you see there, are the five robotic kits version one um, that, we, um, that we assembled for the school. So we create a crate for a class. There are five kits in there, and those are the teacher and student handbooks in there. There was a roll of butcher paper there, which we thought was a brilliant idea. As it turns out, once you use a felt tip pen, butcher paper leaks like crazy. So, so we just use thicker, thicker sheets of A3, and that actually works, works really um, well. Um, what I might have mentioned, uh, what I might have forgotten to mention, these robots draw, they have a pen, they're like logo turtles. And that is another key difference with other, other robotic projects. These things actually produce something directly related to what the kids do. Um, so we assemble these boxes and batteries included and all that, and then there's an assembled bot um, there just for the, the demonstration. So the class purchases one of these kits and they purchase the, um, the workshops that we're going to be leading them through. And in between those workshops are also other things that the teacher just does with the class on its own. Um, so this is what the, I think this is the version one chassis. In any case, it's, a, it's a, an example of what, the, uh, of what the kids are dealing with. So rem imagine 10 year olds, yeah? So they start with this and out comes that. And they do that all in class with a fairly minimal amount of help. But wait, there's more. They soldered the circuit board. So we have entire classes soldering. And um, that takes a little bit of, you know, the risk assessment paperwork and so on needs to be done. It's fairly straightforward. It happens. OK? So um, as you can see, I mean, this, this is the V2. Um, in any case, they're only soldering headers and switches and, and, and simple parts. Nevertheless, they get a good exposure to working with working with a piece of electronics and doing a bit of soldering. So that actually worked quite nicely. So each classroom will be divided in you know, groups of four to six kids. And together, they put together the, uh, the circuit board like so, like that. Um, they all get a little certificate of achievement, but of course, that's always cool. Um, so we set up these little soldering stations on the side of the class, preferably in, with nice light and open windows and all that kind of stuff. Um, there are between three and four um, soldering stations in a classroom, and we have parent helpers uh, or 
other teacher aides to, to assist there. So there's always someone there. We make sure that the other kids are busy elsewhere so that people who are apprehensive about people looking over their shoulder or even the class clowns, they need to be able to get down to it and actually focus. And all of them do really, really well. You have no idea how good these 10-year-olds are at soldering, beware. Um, so that's awesome. The no so now already in Brisbane, there's a couple of hundred more people who are able to solder than there were last year. You know, that on its own, win. Um, and I don't expect them all to become electronic engineers. I'm not, but it gives them an impression of what it's like and it gives them a sense of achievement. They can build something from that level and make it work. So all that put together produces the mirror bot and then they start drawing. And we have a, we have a work with for that that they, that they work for. Now, what I, that uses a visual interface, which I won't bother with, with now. Um, the systems can also be accessed from JavaScript. They talk sockets and web sockets, these robots, over the Wi-Fi. Um, there's also a Python library. So there's a range of things we can do. We don't have to do a drag and drop scratch style. We can do pure Python and, and make things, quite complex programs. That's all, all doable. And at a higher level, you could reprogram the, um, either the Wi-Fi module and or the Arduino and make it do something completely different again. You could make it into an autonomous robot with extra sensors and it's got a couple of spare pins. So, um, so it's based on one, one servo, puts the pen up and down and two, two um, simple steppers to provide the motion. So it's not a speed demon, but it does move and it, it also has a couple of switches and, and line following trickery if you want to use that. Um, so one thing I teach the kids in the very first lesson is mnemonics. So instead of writing forwards so many millimeters, I, we just decide to do F75, would be 75 millimeters. And then the L135, what might that mean, you think? Correct. So this is why it's, it's absolutely spot on with year five mathematics. That's what they work on in that, in that year. That's the kind of one of the many topics, of course, but it is something they do. So they, they deal with um, angles and degrees and obtuse and acute angles and reflex angles and all that kind of jazz um, and units of measure and conversions between them. So they're, they're doing a bit more exercises in terms of if I have so many millimeters, uh, how much is that in centimeters and, and so on. So this is just a practical application of what the kids do anyway. So once the teacher, and that is one of those clincers on why this works in the classroom now, once the teacher has actually explained um, the basics and they've done a few exercises, this goes instead of a lot of drudgery in terms of let's do more sums to actually exercise that new skill that you've acquired. Instead, they do robotics and they just put it in practice in a slightly different context and work on these things. So. Um, this eight-pointed eight star is not in the workbook. It is a suggestion. So they've had to work out how many degrees do I need to turn and how far do I need to move to actually make this work. So the kids worked this out. I have no idea how they worked it out, but they did because evidently it works. The reason that it's slightly offset is because that robot looks like it wasn't entirely calibrated. The pen wasn't right in the middle and there might have been a bit of slippage over one of the motors. You know, you don't end up quite in there, but you see that conceptually, the idea is entirely correct. So they have a name of their team, they have a name of the robot. The name of the robot also turns out, uh, we put that in as the Wi-Fi um, the Wi-Fi network. And then they write on, okay, what project and what iteration am I working on? And, um, and they write out the program. So they often do, when using the drag drop interface, they often just work it out as they go and iterate through it. And every time they, they create a new sheet, which is usually one per iteration. They just quickly scribble out in mnemonics, which is of course really fast. They write out what program they had. So that assembles a portfolio of sheets of paper with, with interesting drawings. And you know, when they draw a house, at first the roof might not be on the house, but on the side or inside the house. You know, that's good for a laugh and you, you get that direct feedback. And it creates a portfolio that the teacher can then assess. They can see the progression in what that team or an individual student has actually achieved. And, and whether they actually understand the concepts. So it actually works very directly and very easily inside the curriculum uh, arrangement. So that's how that started. And um, after that, things went a bit silly. So we started talking to other, to other schools and a lot more happened. 
So let me um, explain what we got to then. Um, it's pretty much got to the point where it became a really good idea to incorporate this rather than running it as a, uh, as a sole trader um, organization. So, you know, we, we like to make things accessible, explain how things work. We think it's really important, as I'm sure all of you here do, um, you know, have a good, for anybody to actually have a fairly good basic understanding of, of technology, you know, be, be techno literate. And um, that, that helps. It helps prevent a lot of problems. It helps people be more comfortable. And our, our society is full of technology and it's just better when we have a basic idea of how to actually interact with it in a sensible manner. Um, so I should, I'll mention a bit about the, um, the implicit inoculation. So this is completely unscientific, but I reckon that if a 10 year old has done some soldering in year five, then when they're in high school and a teacher, parent, anyone else on the planet starts telling them, yeah, you're not good at maths or, you know, girls don't become engineers or, or electronic engineers or something like that. She can just say, yeah, I already did this in year five, whatever. And that is what I mean with implicit inoculation. I reckon that kind of nonsense, and it of course still happens, that kind of nonsense just won't stick. So it will never become a problem. I'm not sure that that soldering experience on its own will achieve that. You know, I'm hoping it will contribute. In any case, it won't do any harm. So, obviously, we like open tools, but, you know, obviously sometimes needs to be explained because why aren't we buying brand X stuff? So, schools do have budgets when they really want something. They will make, they will make it happen. Um, yes, there's grants for things, but, you know, that, that, that gets complicated and it's awkward to rely on those things. So OpenSTEM so far hasn't actually had any dealings with grants or, or subsidies or venture capital or, or, or anything like it. So schools have a limited budget, but they do have means of, of acquiring modest amounts of, of funds. Uh, for instance, school PNCs, depending on the state, are the fundraising body for that school. Okay, and they're very good at it. So open tools also because we'd like to enable beyond the school environment. There are now some kids who actually, whose parents purchased one of these robots and sometimes a soldering kit um, for, for building at home. That's great. Um, that's only a few, but whatever. That, that's still a, an advantage. Um, when it comes to software, life is much easier when they, when they don't have to deal with licensing costs and, and buying things somewhere. It just makes, makes life much, much easier. In many cases, the education departments have licensing uh, arranged on a very large scale for many branded things. However, those licenses either run out the moment the child leaves school, it might only be valid for one machine at home, or at the very best, it runs out a couple of years after they leave school. You know, it still has a, has a deadline and, and a limitation, and that's, that's a problem. And many, many houses now have multiple machines, and why should you limit it to one? Okay. So hardware, by not using specifically branded hardware, we have a larger range. You know, Arduino you can buy from anywhere, as a good example. So we're not restricted to a particular vendor in terms of where we source or where the school wants to source their... Um, their products. And I know of some high schools in Brisbane that use Freetronics gear, and that's great. Um, a single vendor platform hinders adding new stuff because, you know, they have some kind of idea what you're supposed to add, and it has some kind of form factor. And chances are you need to hack it to, you know, fit things in. So having an open design tends to make that easier because it's already built with that extensibility in mind without tying you to, to, to that particular vendor. And then as a practicality, which is more in the range of, for instance, 3D printers. Um, when the tools are open, chances are it's more easily maintainable. You can go to a hardware store and actually buy the spare parts, and you can actually replace the parts. Because if you're not in a major city and you're dealing with a, a warranty issue, are you going to be shipping your 3D printer back to the vendor for fixing? It's not going to happen. You'd need to crate it up and ship. By the time you've done that, you've spent the amount of money that you've spent on the printer. It's not worthwhile. And that makes it into a throwaway product, which is really unfortunate. 
So um, yeah, so if you, in the case of the 3D printer, if the, if the class and the school builds him, then by that time they will have sufficient skill to actually maintain it and operate it properly. That's a whole other sideline story. So things we've run into so far, and I think, you know, conversations that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, but uh, let's play with them. This is an, an interaction and an answer I've recently um, come across, and I think it's a brilliant solution to the old problem. Why do we need to use brand X, you know? Or we must use brand X and product whatever. Um, and you can ask why, <laughs> you know, a typical geek question. And um, it's the industry standard. Everybody out there in the real world uses it. Yeah, so answer is, well, when you learn to drive, did you learn to drive a particular brand model year number of a particular car, or did you learn to drive? And that's a really fundamental question. Of course, people learn to drive. They can step into another brand car and still operate it. So why is that suddenly different with computer software? Why is that so scary? Many people get training in a particular model and they don't actually learn the concepts of that software. They learn, in a nutshell, particular monkey tricks to get from A to B in that software. And that's not real training. So there's a difference between teaching the concept and the skill versus teaching the product. So whatever we try to do in the classroom, we'll, I'll get back to that later, it is really important we teach the skill rather than the product. Because inevitably, the next version of that vendor product is going to look so different, people need to be retrained anyway. So even if we were to go on the line of, it's the industry standard, yes, you, let's use that tool. By the time the kids get out there and use the tool, we're five years along, but even <coughs> two years along, the tool will look significantly different. Okay, and I'm not gonna name any brands and, and things here, but you, you get the idea, I'm sure. So the actual issues are, you know, a matter of how do we teach this and what are we actually focusing on? Are we focusing on how the product actually works? Are we focusing on click this button and click that button and that button to, to make it work? That's the fundamental issue. And it's a level of comfort, obviously. Um, so when we can make people more comfortable, particularly the teachers, more comfortable with whatever technology it is, at that point, they become less afraid of actually, let's say, indulging in a broader range of of brands and, and models of things. Um, here's a heading, digital indulgence. Um, I'm slowly gathering ammunition there. Some high-flying schools think it's really, really cool to run on iPads or Android tablets, but you know, same problem, tablets. And I think it's a hideous idea. And the reason is they're consumer devices. You know, they deliver stuff and we, we see stuff. It seems, and I've, so I've had info, uh, in, uh, feedback on this from, from school teachers, it appears that there are now kids arriving in prep in year one who can't hold a pencil and draw. They have been playing on tablets and do the drawing there. Now, the ability to hold a pencil, I think, is still really, really important. It, it goes into many things in the real world that have nothing even to do with that has nothing to do with pencils, but you know that kind of experience and and training to find motor skills and so on is critical to a child's development, and in this case it's derailed, and I think that's actually quite significant. I'm pretty sure the par parents don't even realise that something has gone slightly wrong. Um, I'm all for playing with tablets, but it can't have been the only thing. You know, my 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 daughter Phoebe was playing with laptops from age three, and she's very proficient now with keyboard and mouse, and that's awesome, but she's also excellent at drawing and writing and, and craft, because she's done both. I didn't particularly design it that way, it just happened that way. I was just astonished to hear about the tablet story. Um, and of course, when it gets to things like programming, tablets become really, really complicated, or even writing. I mean, you can get extra keyboards on them, or keyboard on screen, it's not the same. Um, and you can't get inside and figure out how that tablet works. You can pick a computer apart. Um, not laptops generally, but you get the idea. Um, does every student necessarily need a, an electronic device like a laptop or a tablet? Um, I'm starting to ponder that for real. One per two can be useful in some situations, but it might not even be necessary. In some cases, the drive towards everybody needs computers 
detracts from what we're actually trying to do with them. And I think that's a problem. You know, they're not there for their own sake, they're actually there to serve a purpose. So, um, so yeah, the virtual reality versus the physical touch. I sent the, I sent the skulls around the room, it gives you the idea, right? It's, um, it's actually significantly different. Um, Web-based teaching resources are one of the ones I actually trip over in the last half year. So we're looking at, you know, providing more materials, what's the obvious way, online, because, you know, that's easy to deliver. However, schools do not always have high bandwidth or even a reasonably good, reliable internet connection. You think, oh, that's the schools outside the major cities. Uh-uh, no way. Um, so there are people who reckon that all schools in, in the Brisbane area, for instance, all have fiber connections. No way, doesn't happen. They have something between ADSL and slightly, slightly more substantial. Um, they pay quite a bit of money for that uh, per school with a bit of budget for the department, of course, but it is not as easy as it looks. Now, even when they have a decent connection, the bandwidth is not fantastic. So imagine a school and then you add 500 kids each on their computer doing stuff. The amount of bandwidth you need at that point is significant. Um, you know, the average school, you know, with the 600 geeks here at LinuxConf, 600 kids on their laptops doing stuff, and they may not be doing particularly complicated things, but it requires a significant amount of bandwidth, and it gets complicated. So, and it's not all a matter of proxying, because they they're all are picking up content specific for them. There's different classes working on different stuff. So doing things online is not necessarily the most convenient from that perspective. And then there's other aspects. Um, if kids need to log on, log on to yet another website, that means there needs to be a login. So by now, some teachers that I know, even of my own kids, have between eight and 10 logins for different online services, times 25 kids. The teacher will need to keep track of that because kids lose their passwords and names and, and so on. And in many cases, you don't actually want the email address to go out there, so they make up a separate name. But different organizations have different rules on what name to make up. Different organizations also have different rules on what the password can look like. You know, must have uppercase, lowercase, and digits, and others have other rules and minimum lengths and maximum lengths, and it's all, all is not the same. So a teacher in the average primary school now is the maintainer, the keeper, of about 250 passwords. Doesn't make them happy. So anyone suggesting an online service, oh, you can just log on, good service, and we, we keep it updated and it's all fine. And it's really great because you can keep track of the student's development, we keep a neat log of this. Is kind of thinking of their convenience rather than the teacher's convenience, unfortunately. It would seem like a really good idea, but it seems like it's not. So in a nutshell, for working curriculum material into schools, teachers are busy, they are. And in particularly primary schools, they're not specialists, they're generalists. They're good at teaching and they have a broad general knowledge. So they know about English, they know about you know, literacy, how to you know, get more out of, out of a piece of text and learn how to, how to deal with that. Um, Mathematics, geography, history, science, and, and all those bits. They know a little bit about everything. They're definitely not specialists. Yeah? So when they teach history, they're not historians, and that's very important. And they're time poor. They have so many things to do. They try to cater for individual children and their learning needs and their ways of learning, and that really gets quite complicated. So they need suitable resources, they need professional development, but in a form that actually works for them, because they do need to get on with it. New topics need attention. So ministers and, and premiers and, and lots of other people say, OK, we need to do programming in schools and robotics. Sounds wonderful. And we, we geeks think, yay, fantastic. If only we'd done that years ago. The teachers go, ah. The unions go, ooh. And it all becomes a big problem, because where's that time going to come from? Now, in terms of digital tech, I can tell you where the time comes from. There's a little bit of time carved out of English, and there's a little bit of time carved out of maths. Does that make the teachers happy? Uh, obviously not, because they're already, in some cases, <coughs> troubled about how the kids are doing, and now they have less time for that, and they need to do more time on, on other topics. So if you see there's a separate topic, it becomes really problematic. So that's what we're trying to solve. But I'll get back to that too. Assessment ties into the topics. 
it is entirely possible to create things that are accessible. You may call it a specific test, but it doesn't have to be. And it can actually cover more multiple subject areas. You could be covering English and maths at the same time. However, the teacher does need to have a mapping back, back to the curriculum requirements that they essentially need to tick off. So the particular items in the curriculum, it says, child shall be aware of doing this, or shall be proficient in, in, in distinguishing between this, this type of concept and that type of concept, are they able to do that? And the, the teacher needs to, in some way, be able to assess to, uh, to, to figure that out and actually put a grade on that uh, as a derivative. So if you provide funky things that are across different curriculum areas, you need to provide the mapping. That's the version. So it's a, it's a bit of homework and you actually need to read the curriculum. Most people don't read it. It's actually very interesting stuff and it's actually really, really good. If you see bad materials, it's not the curriculum's fault. The curriculum is actually pretty good. So, now I'll get back to how we were talking with schools. We were talking about doing robotics programs and some other things like brewing ginger beer, non-alcoholic, in the classroom as a scientific project. And um, then we were asked, so Claire, my wife, is an, is an archaeologist. We were asked, could you do something with um, history, geography? Yes, we can. We were commissioned to build an entire program from prep to six for schools. So now it's there, first term. We're working on the second term in the first term, obviously. One thing at a time. So there's teacher book with handbook uh, with lesson plans. You can read the whole thing. It's all there. Um, so it has photos, public domain or, or liberally licensed. Um, we've, we've got them. The maps are created in QGIS by Claire, because she's, she has 25 years of experience with, with GIS, so that, that's a real, real beauty there. Um, so we can, you know, which of the countries in the Middle East? Need highlight, put it in the document, easy as, okay? So, and QGIS just produces beautiful things, provided you're competent with QGIS. Um, the data that we use as a basis of that is open data of course, and multiple layers of it. And now I'm going to try and switch to some examples. No, that was optimistic. Oh, come on, no. I might need to zap out of it. There, okay, where's my mouse? Okay, um, you might not see much of it, but the idea is so this is a teacher handbook for year three. Uh, it's called Celebrating Our World. So it's one unit that lasts one term. So it's a bit of a description for the teacher on what to expect, you know, what, what they will be doing this term. On the next page, a list of PDF resources that they will be using during that term. That th those are all PDFs that we provide. So they contain text, um, text images, you know, what, whatever is necessary. Um, Student PDF, so there can be a student workbook, there can be some homework sheets. Homework is generally in the range of research. Ask your parents, discuss this, bring information back, rather than the drudgery of just filling in, filling in sums, because that's boring. We don't need to do boring. Um, black by map, I'll show you that in a moment, and other resources that you need. So it's essentially a little shopping list, what am I going to need for the coming term? Okay. Um, yep. There. Okay, then information for multi-year level classes. Many classes around the country are not 